Good evening. I just started the recording. I'm going to welcome all of you to Batty about Castle Rock. While we uh, take a moment for some, maybe some last minute uh, people to join the webinar, I will do some introductions. So my name is Amy Graziano and I work uh, as the outreach coordinator at Douglas Land Conservancy. We are, for those of you who are uh, new to DLC, we are a local nonprofit land trust. We're located in uh, Douglas County and we've been around since 1987 protecting open space um, in, in our region. And so we are proud to today protect over 24,000 acres and we, um, those lands that we protect, uh, we work with willing landowners. So those would be lands like um, private ranches and farms that people would like to uh, see forever un untouched and undeveloped and unspoiled. But we also uh, protect lands with local municipalities like uh, Douglas County Open Space, Town of Parker, and our partners at Town of Castle Rock that we're putting on this presentation with tonight. So if you're new to GLC, um, I hope you get our emails going forward and can join us at other events. We host quite a few events during the year all um, great opportunities to get to know your local open spaces, go hiking, uh, do some uh, bird watching, some take a class on wildflowers, um, and, and a lot of other uh, fun things. So if you're watching your email uh, in the coming weeks, we have the newest open space in Douglas County, owned by Douglas County Open Space and soon to be protected by Douglas Land Conservancy, Sandstone Ranch, opening up soon. And so I uh, would love to send you some information on that and get you out there to hike the newest trails in Douglas County. It's gorgeous. I've had a sneak peek. Um, we also have, we did a hop hunting recently and harvested hops on a private, uh, private property in, um, in Louviers. And we're going to have uh, 105 West, a local brew pub, make, uh, make a beer for us. And so maybe you want to come out and, and taste uh, some local hops made into beer. So a lot of fun activities related to land and land conservation. And uh, like I said, we do programs uh, with the town of Castle Rock. And for five years, we have hosted a series of educational programs with them that we have called Animals Around the Rock. And maybe you've attended um, raptors over the rock, reptiles under the rock, and tonight we have Batty about Castle Rock. So we're excited to um, share some information with you this evening about bats that share, uh, share our, our region. So thanks to Town of Castle Rock again, and I want to introduce you to Kate Hogan. She's with Denver Audubon. She's going to be doing our presentation this evening, and our presentation uh, will take approximately an hour. And although uh, we've all had a lot of experience in the last few months with Zoom, um, this program this evening might be a little different. It's not set up like a meeting, it's set up as a webinar. And so the difference um, with that is that all the participants, um, there's no way for you to be seen or heard. So have, get your PJs, whatever it is, you know, whatever. You don't have to worry about muting. Um, and we're going to just uh, listen to Kate speak and then at the end we are going to have time for Q&A and we will utilize the chat for that. And so actually there's Q&A or chat, whatever works for you. And I will probably, um, so that she can, you know, make it easier for her, I will probably read your questions to her and then she will, um, thank goodness I won't be answering because I'm sure I won't know the answers to your questions. So. We have Kate Hogan, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening and for all that Denver Audubon does. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. One of my favorite animals to share about is bats. Um, so I'm very excited to be here tonight. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, even though I work for Denver Audubon, my first love really was mammals, actually. And so for a long time, I really wanted to study mammals. And originally, that was part of why I went to college, so that I could study wildlife biology. Um, and then I had the pleasure of actually living in Australia and seeing some of the bats that we're going to talk about tonight in our introduction before we get a little bit into some of our Colorado bats. 
So there's so many different bats and, and a lot of bat diversity out there. And so uh, we're gonna kind of talk generally about bats and then get a little bit more specific on some of our bat species here in the state. So this is a, a presentation, um, Hunters on the Wing, Beneficial Bats, and also Swooping Swallows. So I did throw a few swallow slides in here, um, but that's because in my own experience, I've actually seen people point at a swallow and go, hey, look, it's a bat. Uh, and you can actually tell the difference uh, in a variety of ways. So I want to kind of share a little bit about the ecological role, the niche that those animals play, um, because it's actually really amazing how both of them are these incredible aerial hunters, but they do it at different times of the day. So together, combined with their superpowers, they provide 24-hour insect control, uh, at least in the state of Colorado. So we are going to Jump in. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about Denver Audubon quickly before we go into our, our bat information. So our mission is inspiring actions that protect birds, other wildlife, and their habitats through education, like what you'll be experiencing this evening, conservation, and also research. And so we really um, have held to kind of this new mis mission statement over the last couple of years. We wanted to really put in that part about inspiring action. So in every outreach presentation that we provide, we wanna give you members of our community things that you can take home with you, or in this case, you're already home. So maybe take out into your backyard and be able to make positive actions and changes for wildlife in our area. So we were founded in 1969. And um, so we have been connecting people with nature for the last 51 years. Um, and we're also partially funded by the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District. Um, which is a lovely local grant program. And then I like to just kind of explain the differences between who we are versus say National Audubon or Audubon Rockies. If you're a member of National Audubon, um, we thank you. National Audubon is an amazing organization. Our uh, Denver Audubon organization is actually a separate 501c3 nonprofit. Um, so we're not under the guidance and the leadership of National Audubon per se. Everything that we choose to do is on the local level based on what we see happening in and around Denver specifically. And then also Audubon Rockies is a regional office of National Audubon. So they work within Arizona, Utah, Colorado, um, and some parts of Nebraska and Wyoming as well. So we actually are, aren't funded by National Audubon. Everything that we have here and the programs that we do is funded on a local level um, by local supporters. And then these are just some of the different programs we do. So if you're interested, we offer webinars as well um, on similar topics. We'll be doing a Native Plants for Birds webinar next week. Um, we have a Young Birders Club that's headed up to Echo Leak this weekend. Um, to go birding with a small group while everyone is masked. So we have a lot of different programs that we offer. So I encourage you to check us out. And then we also have the Audubon Nature Center at Chatfield State Park. If you've never been, this is where a lot of these um, bats are seen. So some of the bats that you're going to learn about in the presentation tonight are bats that we actually did some research on um, and we were able to discover specifically the species that we had flying around kind of the South kind of Highlands Ranch area, Littleton, um, and there's really cool ways that researchers discover what types of bats are in an area. So we'll talk about that. And this is free for you to come visit our Audubon Nature Center. So we encourage people to check it out. And then we would be nowhere without our 150 incredible volunteers. We have six staff, so we're very small, similar to Douglas Land Conservancy. Um, and so we just would not be anywhere without these incredible volunteers. So I always like to give a shout out to them. Um, so this is gonna be kind of uh, a little interactive, if you don't mind, and even though we can't all hear each other, uh, you can compete against your family members if you want. So I've got a little bit of question and answer in here, and then I also have some myths that we're going to talk about with bats, uh, information that's sort of been shared that just isn't accurate at all. So when we're talking about a bat, do you think an animal, uh, a bat is an animal that is a bird, a mammal, an insect, or maybe a dinosaur. So we'll let you think about that for a second. 
And there are some hints if you look over on the body of the bat in this image. This bat is covered with fur, um, especially on the chest portion and the back. So bats are mammals, just like people. They have fur, they have milk that they feed to their babies. Um, and so they also have adorable young. <laughs> I have a lot of people who say, oh, bats, bats are, they're scary, they're frightening, they're ugly. Um, I had to throw in a picture of adorable baby bats wrapped in blankets. So these are some of those bats that I mentioned earlier when I lived and studied in Australia. Um, they had flying foxes that live there, and flying foxes are a different type of bat than what we have here in North America, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but I think when wrapped up in blankets, they're almost as adorable as human babies. Um, so they are mammals because of a lot of their special physical and behavioral adaptations that they have that make them different from birds or reptiles or amphibians. So bats are mammals. There's also over 5,000 thousand different types of mammals that live on earth. It's, we are an incredibly diverse group of animals, not as diverse as say something like insects, um, but a lot of people think that mammals are, um, these bats that are mammals are flying rodents. And so I wanted to show you this uh, kind of graph, this pie chart here, that shows you all of the different groups of mammals that we've discovered so far on planet earth. And it turns out that bats actually are not rodents at all. So rodents are rodents and bats are in a group called Chiroptera. So rodents have teeth that never stop growing. That's part of why mice and rats and beaver sometimes can be considered to be pest animals because they have to be chewing on things all the time. And that's because their teeth never stop growing. Bats have teeth similar to ours. So if you look at this picture, you can actually see that they have quite a number of small, tiny, sharp teeth. They also have molars, just like we do. Um, so if you want to take a second and share with your family or just think to yourself some of the rodents that we might have in Colorado, um, which are very different from our bats. So we have things like squirrels and mice and rats and beaver and prairie dogs. And the list goes on and on and on because there are more types of rodents than there are any other type of mammal on the planet. However, bats are second in their diversity behind rodents. So the myth is that bats are flying mice. The truth is that bats are not at all rodents. They are in the order Chiroptera. So Chiroptera comes from a Greek uh, term, which means hand and wing. So believe it or not, bats are actually more closely related to us as primates um, and lemurs, which are kind of the closest thing that scientists can find so far genetically. So it's kind of like bats and lemurs are cousins, but they're more closely related to us than they are rodents. Um, and so this is a really wonderful illustration. It shows you where that hand wing name comes in. So bats, when they're flying, are actually flying almost with their hands. So they have similar bones in their wings to our hands, but those bones have been stretched out. And then there's skin that goes in between their bones that allows them to be able to actually gain lift and be able to fly. So really incredible mammals. They are the only mammals, in fact, that are capable of powering their own flight. So we do have, of course, certain types of mammals out there. You might have heard of flying squirrels. Flying squirrels are gliding, they're jumping. They have to climb up somewhere and then they jump and they kind of parachute down, but they don't actually have the muscles to be able to lift themselves in the air. Mammals use, these uh, bat mammals use their back and their chest muscles to fly. Birds only use their chest muscles, but bats also use their back to help power them up since bats are a little bit heavier than birds. 
a lot of them actually drop into flight from a hanging position. So that's where there's a lot of stories about how bats, you know, hang upside down, and that's very similar to vampires and what vampires do. Um, but bats have to hang upside down in order to be able to drop themselves into flight. Some of them can crawl onto a rock and maybe hop a little bit in order to gain the elevation they need. But unlike a bird, a bat cannot take off straight from the ground. They have to get a little bit of elevation in order to be able to open their wings and then start powering their flight. And then when we are talking about bat diversity, we want to celebrate all of their differences. There are over 1,200 different types of bats across the globe. And if you're interested in learning more about bat conservation and bats all over the planet Earth, Bat Conservation International has a wonderful website with lots of great resources. Um, and so I love to encourage people to go and explore their website after we're done here tonight or maybe tomorrow. So when we're talking about the two big groups of bats, there's megabats, which are those kind of like those flying foxes that we saw wrapped up in the blankets. And then we've got micro bats. So megabats live in tropical and subtropical areas in Africa, Asia, and Australia. They like to be in the tropical rainforest exclusively. Microbats live nearly everywhere on the planet, on six of the seven continents, actually. And so here in Colorado, all we have are microbats. We don't actually have any megabats. And then there's also some information later about vampire bats, because I know that that's also a common question that we have. So in Colorado, we only have microbats. And when we're talking about a microbat, they call them microbats because just generally they're smaller in size. Many of them only have a wingspan that's just a few inches long. Some of them might have a wingspan, so from one tip of their wing to the other, it's 10 inches or maybe 12. In some cases, they might only have a wingspan that's eight inches long, so it's less than a foot, not very big. Um, and so that's why they call them microbats, because they tend to be smaller. The other really fascinating adaptation that microbats have is the ability to echolocate. So you've probably heard about echolocation before. This is something that a lot of animals will use, a lot of animals in the ocean, and then also bats as well. So echolocation calls are ultrasonic. And what that means is that they're above, they're so high, they're so high pitched that our ears aren't even able to hear them. And we should be really grateful for that because if our ears could hear their sounds, it would be so high pitched, it might actually give us a headache. So it's really wonderful that we can't hear them. Um, but echolocation allows them to be able to decipher all kinds of things. Decipher means to figure out. They can figure out the size of something, the shape of it. They can figure out the texture. Is it bumpy? Is it smooth? They can also determine the speed and the direction of something that is moving from the echo that comes back to them. And what's really cool is they produce different calls at different frequencies. So what that means is that um, you can actually do research on what bats are in your area based on using equipment that can pick up these echolocation calls. And so that's something actually that the Douglas Land Conservancy has some volunteers that have done already in some of the open spaces. Now at Denver Audubon, we do not have that fancy equipment to be able to do that. So we figured out what bats we had around Chatfield State Park um, using an old-fashioned method but technology is really catching up and there's actually even if you'd like apps for your smartphone now as well as little devices that you can plug into your own phone to be able to pick up signals of bats that are echolocating around you so technology is just incredible there's so many advances now so when we're thinking about echolocation, that brings us to myth number two. Bats fly into human hair. They fly at our heads, they try to attack us, they wanna go after our hair, 
But bats can so efficiently use echolocation that they can actually detect almost every single hair on a human head. It's more likely that they're going after an insect that might be flying around your head that you don't even see. There might be a mosquito that buzzes by your ear and the bat is going after that insect. It's not going after you. So can you maybe think about some insects that might be flying around at night that a bat might try to go after? Let's see. So there's a lot of insects that fly around during the day, but there's some very specific insects that like to fly around at night. So we talked about mosquitoes. One bat might be able to consume upwards of 3,000 mosquitoes in a single evening. But if they can, they're going to go after a moth. So if you've ever snacked on things like Cheerios, you might have, you know, a couple hundred Cheerios, but it doesn't fill you up the same way that, say, having a big hamburger or a veggie burger might fill you up. And so bats prefer to go after larger insects like moths, flying beetles that might be around at nighttime, and then also little tiny bugs similar to mosquitoes called midges. So midges are the insects that fly around in clouds near some sort of a pond or a lake, and they fly around in clouds like that above the water. Um, and so bats will fly through the clouds and use their echolocation and be able to snatch up all kinds of midges in one single swoop. So it's really incredible that they're able to do that. So myth number two, bats fly into human hair. Now we know the truth. Bats can absolutely avoid your hair. So no need to be concerned about that. And then we're also going to have to talk about hibernation because of our bats that live here in Colorado. So again, we only have micro bats in Colorado. We do not have warm weather year round. We also don't have insects year round. And that's the same reason why a lot of birds migrate out of Colorado in September and October. Most of our Colorado bats actually migrate as well. They'll migrate to Mexico as far away as Mexico and Central America, but many of them stay here with us in the state. They actually will just go to other places to hibernate for the winter. So they might go find a cave somewhere. They might find a place in someone's barn. And they're also the only mammals that are able to regulate their own body temperature. So with us, our body temperature is usually the same. If it changes, it means that we're sick. But when it comes to bats, they can actually choose. So in the winter time, they can drop their own body temperature below freezing, down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And they'll drop their heart rate down to 10 beats per minute. So that means in 60 seconds, their heartbeat's gonna go boom, boom very slow. And that allows them to be able to withstand our cold winters that we get sometimes here in Colorado. The, the bats that migrate are actually just like birds, kind of triggered by the day length. So you might have noticed that when it's time for dinner nowadays, the sun is setting a little bit earlier. And that's because we're getting closer to winter time. And the bats know that that also means, hey, colder weather is on the way. So that brings us to myth number three, that bats like to drink blood. Only three species of bat in the world are known to drink blood, and all of them are found in South America. So these are our three vampire bat species, three species out of 1,200. So most bats have a really wonderful role and job that they do for us, and vampire bats actually prefer chicken and cow blood more than they would ever go after a person. So what they do is they wait until the cow or the chicken falls asleep. They sneak up into a barn. They take their little tiny teeth and they make a little scrape in the skin of that animal. And then they actually lap up the blood. Now, correction. We did have some vampire bats in Colorado. Does anybody know where they were? The Denver Zoo. <laughs> 
So we did have some vampire bats that lived in Tropical Discovery, and they would feed them little tiny bowls of cow blood, and that's what they eat. Other bats eat so many different things. They eat fish, some of them drink nectar, some of them eat the pollen from flowering plants, and fruit. Remember those microbats from before? Microbats love to eat fruit. That's why they'll live in the tropical rainforest and they'll actually go in search of fruit in the top of fruit trees. And we don't have a ton of fruit trees in Colorado um, that, that belong here naturally. So myth number three, bats like to drink blood. The truth is that our bats in Colorado eat insects. We have no reason to be worried about vampire bats. So these are four of the bat species that we found at Chatfield State Park in partnership with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So if you have ever been to our nature center or if you've ever heard of Bird Conservancy of the Rockies up at Bar Lake, there's a process when you're looking for animals called banding. And with birds, what we do is we set up some nets during the daytime and we wait for birds to fly into the nets and then we take them out of the nets and we figure out what types of birds we have. Well, when you're actually doing a bat survey, it's very similar. You take nets, but you set them up at nighttime and you usually put them around a pond or by a river or a creek. And so we have two ponds right by the Audubon Nature Center at Chatfield. And there were some scientists that came out from Colorado Parks and Wildlife and put these nets up at nighttime and then waited for bats to fly into them. And then they put on protective equipment, very thick gloves, because bats do have tiny little sharp teeth. So if they're scared, they could bite a scientist that's looking at them. So for protection, they put on some gloves. And these were the four species of bat that they found. So we're going to go through some of this fun information about these bats. So first, we have the little brown bat. And these are one of the most common bats found in Colorado. They live in people's houses. Um, they will find places in your attic, in barns. They will live in urban parts of the city. Um, so down in downtown Denver, if they can find the right habitat, even within the city. They also like to roost or sleep. Roost is another name for sleeping. In tree hollows, beneath tree bark, in or under buildings, bridges, and also they'll find teeny tiny little cracks in rocks and they'll climb in there and they'll sleep there as well. So I put up a picture of this Plains Cottonwood. So the Plains Cottonwood is one of the big huge trees that we have in Colorado and if you've ever looked closely at the bark of a Plains Cottonwood, some of our older cottonwood trees, the bark starts to split away and it makes these nice little cracks. And so little brown bats will like to climb up in there and roost there overnight. These are also bats that might utilize a bat house. If you put up a bat house in and around your neighborhood or in and around a park or an open space and they forage over water and they really prefer aquatic insects. So if you don't live near a water source, putting up a bat house may not attract these bats. It might attract yellow jacket wasps, or some other type of critter that might want to go up there. But they love to eat caddis flies and midges, as well as mosquitoes and other types of flies, and then also moths. So sometimes if you put up a bat house, it doesn't always mean you're going to get a bat. A fun fact about them, though, is that they will sometimes fly over 50 miles a night looking for insects. So really incredible little bats to travel that far given um, their size. And so they're pretty small. Their wingspan's about 10 inches, so less than a foot. Then you've got the big brown bat. And actually the big brown bat is not that much bigger than the little brown bat. So when they're flying around, it can be difficult to tell which bat you have. Um, that's where the echolocation really comes in handy. So these guys are also found near humans in cities and towns. Um, and so they will occupy similar places to the little brown bat, um, but they prefer beetles and larger flying insects. 
So they're really critical to help us control some of those bigger insect species, while the little brown bat is helping us to control some of the smaller insect species. And then the big brown bat will hibernate in mines and caves and storm sewers and attics. So they don't actually leave Colorado and migrate, they just go somewhere else to overwinter. And a really fun fact about not just big brown bats, but a, a number of bats actually, is moms can recognize their own offspring, their own babies, even in masses of newborn bats. So they actually can smell which baby is theirs because they and their baby have a similar scent. And so they use their nose to help them figure out when there's lots of babies all in one place and all the moms leave to go out and hunt together and then the moms all come back. When she, when she gets back to the roost, she sniffs to find which baby is hers. I'm glad I don't have to find my children that way at school pickup. And then we also have the hoary bat. So these guys are really fun. They look like they've been to the salon and had their tips done on their hair. Um, they live in any habitat where there's trees, but they're migratory. So they actually live in Colorado from April through about November. They prefer moths, but they'll also eat things like beetles. They'll even eat wasps, grasshoppers, and smaller bats. So if they can find a smaller bat, they will actually eat other bats as well. Um, and then a fun fact about them is that these moms can actually fly with babies clinging and nursing to them at the same time. If they can leave their babies at a roost site, they'll do that, but they have been observed flying and hunting with a baby attached to them. So any moms that have gone to the grocery store with a baby and a carrier and a baby and a grocery cart and you're trying to grab everything you need, you're gonna understand what the hoary bat mom goes through. And then finally, we've got our red bat. You can see how they get their name. They have kind of this beautiful orangish red rusty color. They also love cottonwood trees and deciduous trees where they'll roost. Um, so deciduous trees are other types of trees that drop their leaves in the fall. So they'll usually roost only four to 10 feet off the ground. So not very high up. And then they take advantage of insects that are attracted to lights near things like a street lamp. Um, so moths and grasshoppers and crickets are also their favorite insects. You're gonna, you're gonna sense a trend here. A lot of these insect eating bats are eating the same thing. And then red bats are another migratory bat species in Colorado. And the bats will migrate in groups of um, different genders. So male bats will migrate together and female bats will migrate together. So really, really fascinating. So that brings us to myth number four. Bats are dangerous. A lot of people worry about bats and rabies, and bats can contract rabies, similar to a number of other animals that we have in Colorado, including dogs, skunks, raccoons, um, weasels. So there's a number of different mammals that can contract rabies, but realistically, uh, less than 20% of bats have actually been infected by the rabies virus. And that is assuming that one of those bats actually comes in contact with a person. So it's very rare that someone is bitten by a bat. Usually it's because someone tries to go and pick up a bat when they should not have picked up a bat. Um, so we talked about if you have uh, gloves on, protective equipment, if you're a bat scientist and you know what you're doing, then handling a bat might be an okay scenario for you. But if you come upon a bat that's crawling lethargically on the ground in the middle of the daytime, you're gonna wanna call either your wildlife manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife or local animal control. So in Parker, we have our own wildlife manager and then Larkspur and Sedalia and Castle Rock have other wildlife managers. But no matter where you live, you have a district wildlife manager and they are someone who can help you with that. And they can come collect the bat and they'll want to take it and ensure that that bat isn't actually sick with rabies. And so they'll test it and make sure. 
A lot of healthy bats are gonna be flying around during the evening hours. So if you see a bat in the middle of the day, that is not normal. Um, and the thing with bats is that unlike dogs or skunks, bats, when they have rabies, they don't go through the rabid stage. So they don't actually act like a little crazy or aggressive. They just get lethargic. Um, and so the way that they act when they have that virus is very different. So the myth number four that bats are dangerous, the truth is that there's a lot of other animals that harbor rabies more so than bats. And in fact, in Colorado, skunks are one of the bigger concern. Um, so there's some great information on the Colorado Parks and Wildlife website about cases of bats and rabies in the state. Um, and they've got lots of data on confirmed cases within the state of Colorado but most of the time it shouldn't be a concern. And then I also wanted to share with you about this incredible bat viewing experience. If you've never been, this is a hike that you can go take outside of Salida. Um, about 30 minutes or so south of Salida, Colorado is a place called the Orient Mind Land Trust. And so similar to Douglas Land Conservancy, part of what their job is, is to buy up land and then envelop it into the trust so that it doesn't get developed for other things. And they have this really incredible hike that you can do where you can go see 200,000 Mexican free-tailed bats flying out over this valley every night from usually May until September. And these bats migrate out of Colorado, the whole 200,000 of them. They just one night decide, okay, it's time to go. And they all take off and they leave. So this is an awesome hike for a bucket list for anyone who's interested in wildlife in Colorado. Um, and I've done this hike now a couple of times. Um, it's straight up about a mile and a half. So you definitely wanna be in some good shape take hiking poles with you. Um, but if you go to the Orient Land Trust website, there's all kinds of information about when the bat tours leave. They have volunteer naturalists that take you up. Um, and it's just incredible to watch thousands upon thousands of bats fly past you and you can feel the wind from their wings. It's just incredible to see and experience. So um, we're going to switch gears now for these last final minutes, and then we'll take some questions. So swooping swallows. Swallows have a similar ecological niche to bats in that they hunt all of these different flying insects, these aerial insects, but they do it during the day, and then the bats take over the PM shift at night. So between swallows and bats, we've got 24-hour insect control along the front range. So a niche, an ecological niche or niche is the job that an animal performs within nature. So when we're thinking about what type of an animal a swallow is, so we learned that bats were mammals. Um, a swallow is going to be a bird, a mammal, an insect, or a dinosaur. Hmm. Well, they're not covered in fur. They're covered, they're covered in feathers and they lay eggs. So they are absolutely a bird. This is a migratory bird, so they're only here in spring and summer and early fall when they can eat those insects. Birds lay eggs, they have hollow bones, and they don't feed milk to their young, but instead, over 96% of our terrestrial birds, that's birds that live on land, feed insects to their young, not seeds, uh, not plant material, not milk they actually feed insects to their babies. And so insects are the little things that run the world, according to a very famous environmental scientist and author, E.O. Wilson. Insects are the little things that run the world because they do. They run our bats and they, they run our bird species. So this is a barn swallow. This is one of the most common swallow species that you'll see. And they have a long forked tail. And when they fly, they're similar in size to bats. But the difference is that with the swallow, they will oftentimes fly uh, more on a straightaway. And when bats fly, they move back and forth. And they're actually a lot more maneuverable than a swallow might be. 
And then this is a different swallow species we have called the northern ruffed wing swallow. So oftentimes people don't notice northern ruffed wings as much um, because they're kind of just gray colored with a little bit of white. But the longer you start kind of watching swallows and observing swallows, you'll actually start to see that there's a lot of swallows that flock together, especially during migration. And you'll have hundreds upon hundreds of swallows that are all flocking together, but they're all different species. And then this is a beautiful swallow called a tree swallow. They have that blue coloration and then the white underneath. These are often swallows that are going to occupy a birdhouse. So if you put a birdhouse up, you might actually get tree swallows that utilize it. And then this is another one of my favorite swallow species called the violet green swallow. They have a green back and then a purple to turquoise rump. Um, and so they are just beautiful, beautiful swallows um, that we also have along the front range. And if you have swallow nests that are on the side of your house, barn swallows are the most common swallow species in the globe. They're found all over the planet, not just in North America. And barn swallows have figured out how to build their nests on our man-made structures, similar to how you might find a bat roosting on your front porch some night, just because it's traveling around and it thinks your front porch looks like a nice place to take shelter. So swallows oftentimes get a bad reputation because they'll build their nests on the side of our buildings. But I wanted to make sure that you know that it is illegal to move any swallow nest if there's babies and parents that are sitting on it. So these are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And so you can remove swallow nests, but you have to wait until now. So now that it is September, you're allowed to remove those nests if you need to. So with bats, again, and their important role as insect control, they control insects over a lot of our agricultural crops. So chocolate, sugar, walnuts, rice crops, all of these things that we plant because we love to eat them, bats come in and help provide a natural insect control so that we don't have to use pesticides necessarily. And then again, a single bat can consume up to 3,000 small insects in a night. So there's so many different great things that bats do for us. And then they also pollinate. So not our micro bats that we have here in Colorado, but when we're thinking again about some of those macro bats, the really big bats, there's some plants that rely solely on bats for pollination. So if you love avocados and guacamole like I do, if you love mangoes, wild bananas, figs, all of those things rely on bats to pollinate them, albeit tropical species. And then if there's any parents or grandparents in the room that love tequila, agave plants uh, actually rely on these bats as their primary pollinators. So if we don't have any bats, we don't have any margaritas either, which makes for a sad world, I think. And then there's only two different species out of all of the 1,200 species of bat that pollinate guava. So if we lose those two bat species, we're going to lose guava juice as well. And then when we talk about swallows, they're not as efficient as bats, but a single swallow can consume 60 insects per hour, which could be up to 850 insects per day. So not too shabby, um, but compared to our bats, uh, not quite as efficient. So if you're looking for ideas of how you can help bats or help swallows in our area, you can build a bat house and place one in your yard. Again, though, as we learned, some of our bats will utilize a bat house and some of them won't. So if you build a bat house but you don't get bats in it, don't be discouraged. The best place for a bat house to go actually is near a local pond. Um, or near a local creek. Not so much in our backyards, unless you have your own private lake or pond. And if that's the case, then absolutely put up a bat house. You also wanna be mindful when you go caving. 
Caving is a recreational activity where people actually strap on some harnesses and they go down into caves. But disturbing bats while they're hibernating can be really fatal. And so there was a wonderful group that started at Colorado State University a few years ago um, that's all about cave explorers for bats. And so they work on educating people who like to go caving on the importance of making sure that they don't disturb bats while they're doing that recreational activity. And then we always encourage avoiding the use of pesticides and insecticides in your yard. Um, if you have an infestation of insects coming into your home, then targeted treatments to help solve that problem is totally okay. But a lot of these regular quarterly lawn treatments that are, are being sold um, to a lot of us that are homeowners these days aren't typically necessary and they end up killing off a lot of the insects that we have in and around our homes. Um, but those chemicals don't stay in your backyard. Oftentimes that insect will get up and fly somewhere else and then a bat could potentially ingest it and get very sick. Um, as well as a lot of our birds that eat those insects as well. You can also grow a bat garden. So there are some native Colorado plants that love to actually open up their blooms in the evening hours. And that can attract different insects that bats would love to enjoy eating as well. And then if you're looking for something to do for swallows, you can place a birdhouse in your yard for tree swallows. We shared about that. This photo is a group of tree swallows, two of which are having a disagreement about who gets to move into that birdhouse. You can also leave dead trees in your yard to help create perching opportunities for these birds. Um, and also a dead tree provides an opportunity for them to nest naturally. So a birdhouse is an artificial way to kind of promote nesting behavior. But if you have a dead tree and it's not in danger of falling down on your house or someone else's home, you can actually leave that tree and make it look purposeful and intentional. And then you can also plant native plants that support our pollinators. Um, that allows for a surplus of beneficial insects for swallows to eat. So a lot of swallows will eat those aerial kind of flying around insects, but they also love to feed caterpillars to their babies. So you're not only helping butterflies by allow and moths by allowing them to be able to have host plants to hatch out more caterpillars, um, but then also some of those caterpillars ultimately end up being the perfect baby bird food. So here's some resources for you. Um, Bat Conservation International, like I mentioned, also Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the Western Bat Working Group, which is a group of scientists that are dedicated to doing bat research in the Western part of the United States. There's also a great book called Bats of the Rocky Mountain West um, by a gentleman here in Colorado named Rick Adams. I also have this little handout. This is a booklet from Colorado Parks and Wildlife just called Bats of Colorado. Um, we have 19 different species of bat that have been documented here, um, but on average, we actually only have 18 regularly. The 19th bats was an outlier. It was one individual that was found. Um, so the state total is 19, but realistically along the front range, we're probably talking more around, you know, a dozen to 18 bat species. Um, and then this is a great book as well that I love. This is called Owls Aren't Wise and Bats Aren't Blind. And this is actually a lot of those different myths and legends around animals that I hear people talk about all the time or I see them posted on social media, on Facebook and next door. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so part of my job as a wildlife educator and a biologist is to really just help put some of those myths to rest and encourage people to really embrace the diversity of all of these different creatures that we have in Colorado and to help celebrate that. So in conclusion, by supporting organizations like Denver Audubon and the Douglas Land Conservancy with your donations, you're helping to ensure that bats have a future in our state. Um, and really, they're, they're very understudied. We need a lot more support for bats across Colorado. Um, so thank you for joining us, and we hope that you'll go out and help bats in your community in the future. With that, um, do we have some questions that you would like to go through, Amy? 
We do, we do. So can you hear me? I can. All right. Uh, the first question is, uh, could you share how many offspring and how often uh, bats reproduce? Excellent. So it depends on the bat, um, but most bats will only have one to two offspring in a year. So similar to humans, um, they realize that trying to manage more than one a year might be a little much for them. Um, and also the fact that since the females do have to leave their babies and go out and hunt and then come back, um, it just makes more sense for them to just handle one at a time. So they don't reproduce very quickly compared to something like a bird that might have four babies in a nest at one time, and they might actually have two clutches in a season that which could yield eight offspring total. So uh, something like a swallow could have four or eight offspring in one summer. Okay, uh, we have a couple more questions. So. If a bathhouse is installed next to a creek or a pond but doesn't get activity for two years, should it be relocated? And how long should the house be in place before it is removed? Is there a way to attract the bats to a house? So um, since a lot of those bats eat insects, um, oftentimes when there is a house that's put up and it's not yielding bat activity, that means that it should probably be moved. It means that in that area, there's not enough insect production to help support the bats hanging out there. Um, but you also learn tonight, you know, some bats will travel up to 50 miles. So sometimes when you see bats in an area, they might just be there hunting for a few hours and then they'll go back to wherever it is that they're roosting. Um, so there's no kind of magical combination for attracting bats to a house. Sometimes the house can get too hot during the day. Sometimes it's too cold. So I would definitely go back to Bat Conservation International because they have a whole section on bat house building and placement and make sure that what you've done matches up with the recommendations that they have. Um, for, for where that house could go. But honestly, at our, at our nature center, we have a few houses and some of them had bats in them the first year I started and then they moved on and they've gone to other, other houses. And I don't know why. Maybe it was too much activity. There were too many predators. It's hard to say. Where, uh, where could you purchase a bat box? Excellent question. So uh, you can go to some of the specialty birding stores. So in Castle Rock, the Wild Birds Unlimited store actually um, sometimes will carry bat houses and also some of our local garden centers. I'm a huge fan of building your own if you can. Um, and so that's great if you have someone who's handy with woodworking or even if you're not, it's a good project to do together as a family. Um, and so that's a great, that's a great option um, if you don't want to buy one. But a lot of the specialty bird stores and garden centers will carry them or you can also go online. And if I can't remember, but Bat Conservation International might have been selling them for a while. They might even be able to mail them because they're in Texas, but they might be able to actually mail a house to Colorado. Okay, uh, the next person uh, misses their bats. They said, first time in 30 years with no bats on my house over my front door, is there a problem? Well, that's hard to say. Globally, we know that insect populations are dropping. Um, there's a great organization called the Xerces Society. It was actually created by a gentleman who grew up in Denver along the Highline Canal. Um, and they do research on invertebrates all over the world. Um, and so we do know that the insect populations have dropped drastically. Um, in fact, uh, we, I had mentioned midges. Um, there's been some studies that have been done up in Wisconsin and Minnesota that have shown that they've lost over half of their midge population. Um, and so I, I did an insect program earlier today, actually, for a group of second graders. And one of the questions we get a lot is, you know, well, why should we care about insects? Um, and again, because insects 
kind of drive everything else. And so if there's bats that are disappearing and, and their numbers are going down, a lot of what, what we see are observations that are anecdotal from community members. Um, there's not a lot of research going into how bats are actually doing. And a lot of that, I, I honestly think, has to do with the bad reputation that they get. Um, so, you know, if, if people are fearful of them, if they don't appreciate the value that bats have for our community, then they're not going to put money toward the research to find out what's happening. Um, so it could just be a seasonal thing. It could be the fires that we've had this year. Um, so if it's just been one year that you haven't seen the bats, I wouldn't be concerned about that quite yet because they could come back next summer. Okay, uh, next question. How can I discourage bats uh, to not roost on my home and poop all over and ruin my stucco? Great question. Um, so there are some different types of uh, bird deterrent things that you can purchase that might also work for bats. Um, there's some things if you've seen for like pigeons, if you don't want pigeons roosting in a certain area, there's little sticky strips that you can get that have spikes on them. And so the spikes are kind of just there to be uncomfortable so that when the animal comes up, they're like, oh, I don't know what all the spiky things are and I can't roost here. So then they move and they go somewhere else. Um, your other option would be maybe to put up a bad house right where they're roosting. We recommend this for flickers. There's a lot of northern flickers that like to bang on people's homes and excavate. And if you put up a birdhouse where they're excavating, it seems counterintuitive, but then they're like, oh, great, I can just go right into that, right into that house. Um, so they'll do that, uh, maybe. So that could be an option for you as well. Okay, I did want to share that there were lots of um, comments about how, how great they um, uh, they thought the program was, so thank you. And two more questions. One, uh, we have droppings on our deck that look like black rice. Are those bat droppings? Yes, those are bat droppings. Yes, I also sometimes I like to call them um, black, black chocolate sprinkles. Um, so yes, yeah, they sometimes look like little tiny chocolate sprinkles. Here's the thing though with some of these bats as well. We've had bats that have roosted and sometimes it's only for a night or two. So if you just find a few little black sprinkles, um, then that might be a bat that was migrating that just stopped over to sleep there for a night or two before continuing on. If you start to find piles of bat guano, then you might have some permanent residents that are gonna hang out with you for a few weeks to a few months. Okay. Um, there is one more question, which I think might take uh, a while to answer. Okay. So I'm going to give everybody the option to stick around or not stick around. But first, I did want to thank you. I want to thank the town of Castle Rock. This has been fantastic. And so Kate with Denver Audubon, we just, this has been wonderful. And I'm going to look at what other programs you offer. And maybe uh, since we're all kind of still, you know, not, not, uh, getting together as often, this might be another, um, another fun thing for our community to, um, you know, to get involved with and, and learn while we're sitting at home. So thank you so Great. much. And I do want to give one more plug. Um, please, uh, Douglas Lane Conservancy, Denver Audubon, we, uh, we exist on the donations from our community. So if you enjoyed it tonight, I would suggest making a donation so that we can continue to host programs such as this. All right, uh, anything you want to add before I ask the last question? Kate? Yeah. Anything you want to you wanna add before we... Oh, no, no, no. No, no, okay. no. You covered okay. it. No, that's great. So, Thanks. last question is, um, have you heard of any cases of white nose syndrome in Colorado? Oh, that is a really wonderful question. Yes. And I did not even think to put a slide in about it. And I should have. Um, the reason being is because no, we haven't had any cases of white nose syndrome in Colorado. Um, so it it's fortunate that I don't have to talk about it. Um, so in the state of Colorado, from the different assessments that they've done, they have not yet found white nose syndrome. Um, so white nose syndrome is something that is a fungus that travels from cave to cave, usually on people's shoes. 
And so they actually traced it back to someone that had traveled here from Europe and had some of the fungal spores on their hiking boots and then went into a cave on the East Coast. And then from there, some of those different caving activities uh, were the things that caused that fungus to spread. So as of right now, fingers crossed, we have not had any white nose syndrome that's shown up in the state. And the fungus itself doesn't uh, actually cause any harm to the bats. Um, but what it does is it gets on their nose and it's kind of like having a rash. It's very itchy and bothersome. And what it does is during hibernation, it wakes the bats up while they're trying to hibernate. So I kind of equate it to if you're trying to sleep and you're exhausted and something keeps waking you up and bothering you and you can't fully get to sleep and get a good night's rest. When you wake up in the morning, you're stressed, you're strung out, you can't concentrate. And so imagine that happening for months on end while you're hibernating. So the bats usually end up dying from secondary issues um, not the fungus itself, because they just get so tired and exhausted and stressed out from not being able to hibernate efficiently. Um, and that's why white nose syndrome is such an issue. But Colorado Parks and Wildlife has been really incredible at monitoring the known populations of bats that we have to make sure that that hasn't shown up. Fantastic. All right. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who attended this evening. We really appreciate it. It's been a great turnout for a great program. So thank you all. And uh, that's it. I learned a lot. All right. Go do something good for bats. Go do something good for bats. Thank you. Take care.